freue mich, euch begrüßen zu dürfen bei der Luxemburg Lecture von John Bellamy Foster, der gerade beim Leica Verlag, mit dem wir dieses Event zusammen veranstalten, sein beeindruckendes Buch Der ökologische Bruch, der Krieg des Kapitals gegen den Planeten veröffentlicht hat. Ähm, beim Leica finden wir auch dieses exzellente Buch, ebenfalls von John Bellamy Foster und seinem Kollegen Fred Markdorf, was jeder Umweltschützer über den Kapitalismus wissen muss. Exzellent, beide Bücher. John Bellamy Foster unterrichtet Soziologie an der University, University of Oregon und ist Mitherausgeber der Zeitschrift Monthly Review. Er hat eine Vielzahl von Büchern veröffentlicht, deren Aufzählung euch vermutlich langweilen würde. Politische Ökonomie, marxistische Theorie, politische Ökologie ist da alles dabei. Vor allem aber ist er der Mitbegründer einer Vision des Marxismus als fundamental ökologischer Weltsicht, was sicherlich eine überraschende Interpretation ist, die aber wiederum Teil eines grundlegenden Umdenkens innerhalb der Linken ist. Und diese Reorientierung linker Positionen findet statt im Kontext einer immer schneller eskalierenden sozialökologischen Krise. Klimawandel und Biodiversitätsverlust, Versteppung und Nahrungsmittelkrise, die Litanei kennen die meisten von uns mittlerweile. Und die meisten von uns wissen mittlerweile auch, dass diese Krisenphänomene mitnichten bloß ökologische sind. Es geht hier nicht um Umweltschutz im engeren Sinne, es geht nicht um die berüchtigten Eisbären und die gesellschaftliche und politische Linke muss nicht zum World Wildlife Fund mutieren. Die Krise ist eine sozialökologische, in der kurz gesagt diejenigen, die am wenigsten dazu beigetragen haben, am meisten darunter leiden. Die ökologische Krise ist also eine Gerechtigkeitskrise und ihre Bearbeitung mithin eine der ureigenen Aufgaben einer emanzipatorischen Linken. Das wiederum wirft zwei Fragen auf. Erstens, wie kann eine solche Bearbeitung der Krise aussehen? Wie kann zum Beispiel der dramatisch eskalierende Klimawandel eingeschränkt oder gar abgewendet werden? Wenn Business as usual nicht mehr geht, brauchen wir dann eine Green Economy, einen Green New Deal oder eventuell eine sehr viel weitreichende sozial-ökologische Transformation? Und aus der Frage nach, dem, nach der Bearbeitung folgt die zweite Frage nach dem Ursprung der Krise. Denn die Bearbeitung kann ja nur erfolgreich sein, wenn sie die Ursache richtig erkennt. Mit diesen zwei Fragen, also woran die Welt zugrunde geht und was passieren muss, um das zu verhindern, gebe ich gleich den äh, Floor an John Bellamy Foster. Und danach, John wird ungefähr 40 Minuten lang reden und danach wird Thomas Fahrtheuer einen kurzen Kommentar formulieren. Thomas war lange Zeit bei der Heinrich Böll Stiftung, hat dort das äh, Brasilienbüro geleitet und hat sich in den letzten Jahren ausführlich mit der Green Economy beschäftigt. Aber jetzt, without much ado, übergebe ich den Floor an John Bellamy Foster. Vielen Dank. Thank you. My, my talk is uh, entitled The Great Rift. And uh, the subtitle is uh, Capitalism and the Metabolism of Nature and Production. And I want to talk about the Marxist approach to ecology, or the, the approach to ecology that really evolves out of Marx. But I want to start out by, by talking about uh, some of the difficulties that Marxism had as, as, a, as a field of thought in, um, in addressing the ecological problem. And the, the big The big uh, difficulty was that there was an epistemological break within Marxism itself that had to do a lot with the, the split that occurred in Marxism between East and West, between Western Marxism, Eastern Marxism, between uh, forms of Mar Marxism that were more uh, geared towards materialism or mechanistic materialism, other forms of Marxism that were geared more towards idealism, Hegelianism, and so on. And um, there was a very severe epistemological split over the issue of the dialectics of nature in particular, which made it extremely difficult for Marxists to approach the problem of ecology. And the way I learned this, and many other people, of course, was, was through Lukács and his famous uh, footnote number six in, uh, in the chapter on uh, what is orthodox Marxism in history and class consciousness. And uh, Lukács uh, said that uh, the dialectic or the dialectical method doesn't apply to nature. 
and uh, I, I could give you the full quote, but we'll, but this was the way we always understood it, that the dialectic couldn't be applied to nature, it could only be applied to society and history. But of course there was another tradition of Marxism that, that came out of Engels and, uh, and uh, who wrote the dialectics of nature that, uh, that uh, was, was very materialist, very, very science oriented, and actually thought that you could talk about a dialectics of nature. You could apply dialectical rules to natural systems themselves. And uh, this, uh, what happened as a result of this is that you had two fractured views with respect to ecology. In, uh, in, the, in the sciences, in, in the Marxists who were doing uh, more materialist, you could say mechanistic materialism, they were, they were uh, developing uh, a relationship to the sciences, they were exploring Darwinian theory, they were exploring ecological thought, uh, but in some ways uh, their understanding of dialectics was, was crude and mechanical and, and obviously there are problems when you try to apply the dialectic directly to nature as, and, uh, and, um, and fail to recognize that it is primarily uh, a, a form of an analysis and, and even uh, a phenomenon that characterizes uh, human history. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, you had, uh, you had Western Marxism and the Frankfurt School and so on, that although they talked about nature to some extent, they, they, um, it was very abstract for them. They, they tended not to be materialists. They saw any attempt to deal with a, a sci science uh, and, and uh, nature directly as, as uh, uh, raising the, the dreaded uh, specter of positivism. And uh, they tended to talk about nature, either it was human nature they were talking about, or it was nature in very abstract terms. And so Marxism was divided in this way. And when the, as the ecological issue uh, developed, in some ways uh, Marxism wasn't as prominent in, in the development of ecological thought as it might have been uh, because of this split. And when, when the... Uh, when uh, Marxists started to develop uh, more ecological thinking in the 1970s, 80s, and so on, in the early 1990s, they tended to graft historical materialist views on top of green theory, rather than, than going back and articulating it in terms of a, of a, of a Marxist approach. But of course, um, you know, part of my argument is, and I'm going to uh, go over this, is that, that Marx actually had a very ecological consciousness. Uh, you know, sometimes we say it was proto-ecological, but uh, the more you look at it, the, the deeper uh, it becomes. And, uh, and I'm going to talk about that. And Marx actually influenced a lot of ecological thought, and there were... Uh, all sorts of ecological developments in the Marxist tradition and the socialist tradition that we've we've forgotten about, uh, and so I, I'm, I'll, I'll get into that. And and always, uh, even in the 1930s, this was there was a moment where where uh, Marx's concept of metabolism, uh, in Lukacs in 1925, 1926, in his uh, Talism and the Dialectic, the manuscript that we now have offered the, you know, the concept of metabolism uh, as the way out of uh, the, the uh, issue of the dialectic of nature and that, that essentially metabolism became the, the, the way in which Marx mediated between nature and society. And Lukács was already writing about that in, in a philosophical sense. And even at the beginning of the Frankfurt School, uh, Eric Fromm in 1932, in in uh, in one of the primary papers that uh, where where he was developing the social psychology for the Frankfurt School, he he said that uh, that metabolism was the key to this to the solving this problem that uh, 
that the Frankfurt School should be listening to Bukharin, who in the Soviet Union had been applying the concept of, of metabolism. So there were, there were, the question was raised, but in, in Western Marxism, they basically, uh, they basically abandoned any kind of approach to science in this area. They, they didn't focus on, on uh, Marx's uh, developments developments around the notion of metabolism and so they uh, w we arrived uh, at this century with uh, with Marxist theory in some ways undeveloped in this area and we have to uh, the uh, uh, I decided that it was it's time we went back and tried to look at what Marx had done and to reconstruct it and see if it wasn't true that Marxism had uh, had a stronger foundations in this area than uh, did uh, standard ecological theory. So um, I, um, in my work, uh, Marx's Ecology, I went all the way back to Marx's dissertation, to uh, his, his work on Epicurus's philosophy of nature in the very beginning, and, uh, and uh, followed out Marx's researches in science all the way through, and came to an understanding of his project where the materialist conception of history was really meant to supplement or to go together with a materialist conception of nature and uh, that the two actually belong together. To talk about materialism and to reduce materialism simply to economics uh, was from Marx's perspective obviously uh, absurd. And, uh, but the the uh, analysis of what we call the metabolic rift, uh, basically uh, adapting uh, Marx's own terminology, uh, this this analysis developed uh, it was developed by Marx in Capital, in uh, in particularly in two places in Volume One of Capital at the end of the the big chapter on machinery and modern industry. He, uh, he dealt with the industrial, he has a small section dealing with the industrialization of agriculture. And Marx was studying the industrialization of agriculture very intensively, reading a whole host of works that were coming out on that, on the application of machinery to agriculture, on the, the role of British high farming. And for, for quite a few years he'd been studying, since the 1840s he'd been studying the work of Justice uh, von Liebig and uh, his soil chemistry and, um, and arriving at, at conclusions uh, with regard to that. And Liebig in 1862, in the 1862 edition of, of his great work on agricultural chemistry, wrote a hundred page introduction, basically blasting, uh, criticizing uh, a full critique of British high farming which was, in, in essence, a critique of capitalist industrial agriculture. And Marx, uh, at that point, he saw this as, as, the, as um, the, the clue to how to approach uh, these issues of agriculture and what we now call ecology. And uh, he, he dealt with Liebig's uh, uh, argument is problematic, and just to go over it, uh, Liebig was, was talking about the robbing of, of the soil and how the, the nutrients, like the nitrogen and phosphorus, the potassium in the soil were being removed from the soil and, and uh, shipped uh, hundreds, and thousands, hundreds and thousands of miles to the cities in the form of food and fiber where they ended up, where it ended up as pollution and not um, returning to the soil. And, and uh, Liebig was, was criticizing the entire uh, agricultural system, industrialized agriculture for this, and condemning Britain and looking at the reality of it, that they were, sh they were, they were taking the bones from the Napoleonic battlefields and the catacombs, and they were, they were uh, bringing guano from Peru to fertilize the soil in, in Britain. He saw this as very imperialistic, and so he, he had this, this uh, very strong critique of British agriculture, and Marx used this to develop his, his own critique, 
and he incorporated the term stuff at soul, the metabolism as, as we translated in English and uh, into his, th this whole notion of material exchange between nature and society into his analysis, into his core analysis of capital. And it's so central to Marx's argument that he defines the labor process and he defines production as the metabolic relation between human beings and nature. He defines production itself in terms of metabolism, in terms of uh, this process. And Marx, in, in developing on Liebig's argument, uh, argued that um, there was a metabolic rift, a rift in the, meta in the metabolism, and uh, that uh, he talked about an irreparable rift in, in the metabolism or the social metabolism because production is social and the metabolism he was talking about was social as well as ecological. It's the connection between hum humanity and nature um, in, through production. And he was talking about uh, the, the, um, the, the robbing of, of the soil and the, of the elementary elements of the soil and the need to restore this metabolism, the, the uh, restoration of this, which was an absolute necessity for, for uh, human society. And he developed a whole notion of sustainability based on this. Uh, so his, uh, his definitions, his, his, uh, def his discussions of sustainability are among the most radical, maybe the most radical you could ever find. Uh, Marx argued in Capital that, that no one owns the earth, uh, not even all the people uh, on the planet together own, own the earth. Uh, they only hold it in, in, as trustees and usufruct, and they, they, uh, they have to maintain it and improve it for future generations. And he defined the whole problem constantly in terms of, of the needs of successive generations. So this is a, a very uh, powerful analysis. And when Marx went on in Capital Three in, one of, in maybe what's considered his most developed definition of socialism, he defined socialism as the rational regulation of the metabolism between nature and society by the associated producers. And so he had a definition of production and an understanding of production that was, was geared to uh, sustainability, uh, that was, uh, that was uh, ecological uh, in the fullest sense, and that connected, it connected his whole theory of capital his critique of capital, the class analysis, to, to uh, a more fundamental ecological critique. And you can see this running through every part of his analysis from the very beginning. So suddenly you have a, you have what you have, uh, you have an, a kind of ecological systems theory, a folk, you know, the, uh, a, a focus on metabolism that's, uh, that connects human society to e ecology, that sees this in terms of specific forms of production, ties it to class relations. There really is no other uh, approach to these problems that is so systematic and so inclusive. I remember when I went to speak in Austria at the Institute in, in uh, Vienna on, on, uh, where, they, where they examined material flows and, and uh, they, were, they were looking at the relationship between humanity and nature, and they, they asked the question, you know, we, we discussed, well, what mediates between humanity and nature? Between, uh, and uh, I said, well, for Marx, it's production. Uh, the metabolism, the social metabolism, this metabolic relation is actually production itself. But it's also, it's, it's on one hand it's social, on the other it's ecological. They, they were saying that what mediates be, between humanity and nature is culture, which given the, the um, definitions of culture that, that exist today, 
uh, leaves you uh, high and dry. There's, there's um, nowhere you can go with that. It's, it's perfectly meaningless. And so um, I think that Marx's approach is extraordinarily important. And what Lukács, of course, was, was saying is in 1925, 1926, which some people recognized, was that this, the, um, this notion of metabolism was a notion, a dialectical notion of mediation and helped you, helps deal with the, the dialectics of nature uh, problem because it's both social and ecological. It's how we, we approach through production, through this notion of metabolism, the, the dialectic of, of nature and society. You can look at the import of this theory in terms of, I mean, some people have looked at this as Marx's uh, analysis of the metabolic rift as, as simply a component of agricultural history, which is fine. And I argued that he was, he was addressing what was called, what has been called uh, the second agricultural uh, revolution and a crisis over the soil that, w that existed in the 1840s to 1860s. But we can point to other similar uh, periods in history where, where there were uh, metabolic rifts, uh, that where, the, where human beings, where, where humanity and, and, uh, w was destroying the soil and, uh, and creating rifts and, and cutting itself off from nature, from the reproduction of, of this relationship with nature, which Marx insisted was absolutely essential. And so we could talk about other metabolic rifts, and some people like Jason Moore, who's um, an environmental historian, have argued that. And I have no quarrel with that, but I think that you can take this analysis and you can look at it in other terms as well. You can look at it as, as a kind of ecological systems theory, uh, a, a systems theory that allows us to, to look at, at the relationship between the social system and, and, uh, and, the, uh, and ecosystems. It, it's a way in which we can have a very uh, systematic analysis that lets us get at the problems we have today. So there's a, a ecological systems theory comes out of this. And incidentally, uh, just to jump ahead a bit, uh, when, they, when in the early 20th century they started to develop ecosystems analysis and, and, and ecological systems theory, they made metabolism as the core concept. Marx was the first to take the concept of metabolism, which, which uh, had been developed in the 1840s and 30s and 40s, primarily in, in Germany, and in, in analysis of, of, of cell structure and, and so on. And uh, it was used by Liebig as well, but he took it and, and used it to explain this relationship between nature and society to talk about the social metabolism as, as the key that, um, that uh, tied uh, all of the analysis ultimately together. So he was, he was working on this. And, uh, and uh, ecological analysis ended up developing in a similar way, but without the, the full social component that, that he provided. The, um, there have been a number of criticisms of well, first of all, uh, b beyond an ecological systems theory, you can say this gives you a materialist dialectic. It gives you, it allows us to extend the dialectic and its usefulness and to uh, address other problems. And uh, there have been a number of criticisms of, of this approach recently. There have been, which is it's nice, there, the, the journal of Peasant Studies uh, and uh, a all, all, whole lot of other journals have been writing papers on the metabolic rift and, and asking questions about the approach. And one criticism that, that Jason Moore and, and Philip McMichael and uh, Mindy Schneider and others have had is that, well, it's a dualistic approach because you're still talking about humanity and nature. But the, the, to talk about metabolism and the metabolic rift is to talk about the mediation between nature 
and society. It's to understand that as based on production, to understand that in doing that, in, in, as that metabolism develops, you're changing human nature or the nature of human society and you're changing the, the nature of external nature as well. You're changing the, uh, what we call external nature. The whole process is being transformed by metabolism. In other words, this is a way to look at these things dialectically. It's not a, about uh, it's not about nature versus human society, but actually finding a way to integrate these because this is what we need most now. Most ecological theory, even eco uh, s social ecology, and, and, uh, but also ecological science is based to a large extent on Malthu Malthusian perspectives that are um, lo much less sophisticated. The other criticism that's commonly addressed at the, the um, metabolic rift is that, well, Marx, Marx didn't know all that we know about ecological science today. You know, he didn't, he didn't uh, his ecological science was way back in the 1860s, and sure, he was uh, up with uh, what uh, Liebig and others were saying, but uh, this is no longer very significant because his analysis is antiquated. But uh, that, that we look at, we, we still have the problem of the soil nutrient, uh, the soil nutrients, that's why we put so much fertilizer on the land. Uh, but um, we know a lot more about the soil than they did in Marx's day. So some people say, well, this is, is not very important because uh, it's, too, it's too dated. But the, the real, the, it's, the, it's the way of thinking. It's the, it's the critical tools, the critical analysis, the dialectical method that's important here and not, not the specifics of the science. Uh, which are still valid, but, but we know a lot more. I, one person who criticized Marx's ecology said, well, Marx didn't know about PCBs and, and um, nuclear power, so he didn't have anything to say to us today. And uh, I think that the, the importance is, is the critical analysis. And I, he had uh, very deep ecological concerns. Uh, I mean, when in 1878, Marx was writing about the role of isotherms. The, the, uh, he was taking notes on isotherms, uh, the temperature zones of the Earth, and how when they moved, uh, that um, caused species extinction. Well, I mean, he was, he was uh, looking at that problem in 1878, and now that is the core issue with respect to, to climate change and species extinction. So. I think there's you know, you know, some credit due there. Uh, but Marx's analysis was to some extent, uh, was, was to some extent um, uh, forgotten or, or not uh, fully followed up on by um, uh, later Marxist theorists. It's true that um, in, the, in, in, early, uh, in the early part of the Russian Revolution, in the, in the 1920s, they had the most uh, developed ecology in in the world, and uh, and figures like Bukharin and Nikolai Vavilov, who 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 discovered the Vavilov areas, the 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 um, sources of germ plasm in the world, the areas of earliest cultivation, and where we have our reservoirs of germ plasm. Um, germplasm, Alexander Operin, who, who along with Haldane came up with the theory of the origin of life, Vernadsky, who introduced uh, the concept of the biosphere, Boris Hessen, uh, who, uh, and others uh, were very, very developed in, in uh, it was the most developed ecology in the world and it was very much based on, on this materialist approach, although sometimes too mechanistic, but uh, but they hadn't completely forgotten about what Marx was doing. Uh, but uh, all of, most of those uh, individuals uh, were purged and uh, died in, in Stalin's purges. The, uh, the uh, uh, leading ecological figures uh, were, were targets, and uh, I won't go into that. But, but uh, I did want to say something about um, the rise of ecosystem analysis. And, the um, Ray Lancaster, who was who was uh, a friend of Darwin's and a friend of Marx's, and was at Marx's funeral, 
and was the leading uh, Dar uh, Darwinian biologist in, in the generation after Darwin, uh, the, uh, uh, he was also, uh, he, was, he was a friend of Marx. He had explored issues of, of uh, uh, degeneration in ecological systems. And he's, he's, he was the first to really discuss and to write about in a major way species, ex human-generated species extinction. And, uh, and he, wa he was a materialist um, uh, s uh, scientist, and, and uh, his student, uh, 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 Lancaster student, was, was Arthur Tansley, who uh, was the founder of the British Ecological Society, and Tansley was the one who developed the concept of ecosystem. And uh, in doing so, he, he, um, he borrowed from Marxist system theory um, developed by uh, uh, Hyman Levy, uh, who was a, a Marxist uh, a scientist, ecologist. Uh, he worked with Lancelot Hogben. Uh, Tansley did it in, in terms of, of combating a, an eco-fascist approach to ecology that was being developed by by general smuts in south africa but the um, but but it was very much came out of what existed at that time was a kind of a a constant interface between marxian and on darwinian ideas and this uh, carried it uh, forward in the british tradition and people like uh, jbs haldane jd burnell Levy, Lan uh, Hogman, Joseph Needham, Benjamin Farrington, Christopher Codwell, and so on. There were all these figures who were bringing together Darwinian and Marxian conceptions. They needed the Marxian analysis mainly for its dialectics. Um, uh, Haldane, who, uh, who wrote the foreword to the English edition of, of uh, the dialectics of nature, was one of the two people to uh, create the neo-Darwinian synthesis where they integrated uh, genetics. And then it um, carried forward further um, in the United States in, in more recent times, uh, people like Stephen Jay Gould, Richard Levins, Richard Lewontin, and so on, all built on Marxian notions of dialectics to develop uh, dial uh, biological concepts. So there, is, there, there has been a kind of a tradition of, of building on some of these things, if not entirely directly. Howard o Odom, who was the leading systems ecologist in the United States, uh, he, um, I mean, he's really considered to be uh, the, the, the founder of, of systems ecology in the world. Uh, and um, he, uh, he wrote a paper, I mean, he studied Marx's work constantly. Uh, it was very important to his own an analysis of, of uh, systems ecology and his attempts to bring this back into the realm of the social. And uh, one of his last papers uh, was, uh, was uh, written with David Sciensman and was called An Energy Systems View of Karl Marx's Concepts of, of Production and Labor. So you have a situation where the leading systems ecologist in, in the world, basically the founder of systems ecology in the post-Second World War period, uh, he, he, was, he was a Marx scholar and was studying the relationship. His, he, the reason what drew him into Marx was he was concerned with the issue of unequal ecological exchange. He was concerned with the issue of ecological imperialism. And uh, he, saw the, um, he saw the situation in a way similar to way, uh, how Marx had with the notion of metabolism, but also with the notion of use value. Uh, Odom really saw use values as the real values, as the natural material value that, um, that, um, uh, under, that was part of every commodity, but to, to it, it expressed our material relationship to nature. And uh, he was, he was uh, concerned, and this is what drew him to Marx, he studied the transformation problem, everything else, was to uh, be able to explain how 
uh, how countries in the global south were being robbed uh, ecologically. There was, an, there, there was embodied energy, uh, or em energy he called it, um, uh, was being trans uh, transferred from the global south to the global north through a system of ecological um, imperialism. And basically, uh, countries in the global south uh, drew more on their free environment. And this wasn't reflected in the prices of the goods under this system. And they ended up being systematically uh, robbed. And, uh, and uh, it, this is very much built on a Marxian framework. And, uh, and uh, it's being used to explain issues like uh, ecological debt today. Uh, some of us have applied Marx's systems theory to try to look at the, the ecological problems we have today. The, we call it the ecological rift or the planetary rift. Um, and uh, their scientists have looked at uh, nine planetary boundaries that, that uh, are crucial if we want to maintain a safe place for humanity. And uh, that's the climate change is only one of those. Um, they're all, they all represent uh, real dangers uh, in, in our time. Climate change, the ozone layer, destruction of the ozone layer, ocean acidification, species extinction, loss of land, loss of land cover, uh, uh, fresh water shortages, uh, aerosol loading, chemical proliferation. These, these planetary boundaries are being crossed. We're leaving the Holocene period and we're, we're crossing these planetary boundaries and creating crises. Uh, but uh, in analyzing this and trying to bring out the social dimensions of it, we've explained these, this, this crossing of these planetary boundaries uh, as, as rifts, uh, basically as metabolic rifts. And uh, it fits with the whole uh, approach of, of the science, which is it uses systems ecology which has the notion of me metabolism presents, uh, provides the fundamental model for the whole thing. So, and so we have a kind of uh, a way of talking about ecological systems analysis that's also very dialectical, that's very tied to Marx, that's very tied to Marx's critique of capitalism as a social system. We can say, for example, as Vernadsky did, uh, that we, we uh, have biogeochemical cycles, um, I mean this is basic to science, that, that the, the planetary system is, is governed by bio, biogeochemical cycles. And we know with the accumulation of capital and the increase in the scale of the system that, that the human economy is rivaling in size these biogeochemical cycles. And so as that happens, uh, the, the biogeochemical cycles are disrupted and uh, the, um, the planetary systems, uh, everywhere from the ecosystems up to, uh, to the climate, uh, are, are, are disrupted and, and this represents to the th a threat to human existence and to uh, life itself. So um, it's very, it's, it's interesting to me because it's so integrated with science. And, Recently, I've brought in another aspect to this. I mean, I have uh, worked for many years in the uh, in um, in political economic analysis as well. Uh, uh, the um, the tradition of, of of economic theory that I come out from is uh, is uh, what we call monopoly capital theory. It's associated uh, most. Um, uh, directly with the work of, of uh, Paul Baran and Paul Sweezy, who wrote uh, Monopoly Capital, although in some ways it goes back to the work of Michael Koletsky and Joseph Steindl in Europe. And, and there are other thinkers who've, who've developed this. And in our study of, in our understanding of uh, Monopoly Capital, the, the, um, the system has Grow, the productivity of the system has grown and grown, maybe by two or three percent a year. Let's say, uh, I mean, the um, for 
for uh, hundreds of years now. I mean, the, it, the, the productivity of the system keeps on expanding. And the, there is a, a tendency for what we call a tendency for the surplus to rise. The overall surplus generating capability of a potential of the societies in, in the advanced capitalist world now is absolutely enormous. And we're faced with market saturation. We're faced with all sorts of problems due to that. And one of the res responses of the system, a systematic response, because as, as, you, as this surplus generating uh, potential develops, they have to find ways of absorbing the surplus. And they can't. Uh, in the lopsided uh, system that they have, where in the United States, 1% of the population, no, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, it's 400 people, I, want, I, I had a different statistic in mind, 400 individuals own as much wealth as the bottom half of the population, 150 million people. So you've got a very distorted system. That's just within the United States. And, with, uh, and so this surplus has to be absorbed, but there are all sorts of problems in terms of absorbing it. Uh, how, do you, how do you promote capital, continued capital formation on that basis? And what they've done is they've built waste into the system on a massive scale, so massively, and we've done studies of this, that, I mean, waste is built into the production structure. As, as Thorsten Veblen said, uh, there, the uh, waste, the sales effort penetrated into the cost of production. So most of what we call cost of production now have to do with sales rather than the, um, what's necessary to actually produce the goods, the commodities. So, and there's waste everywhere in the system. We, in the United States, we spend a trillion dollars a year on marketing, just getting people to buy things. So with this, this, um, this waste actually represents a destruction of use values in various ways. The, the use values, of what workers buy when they, when they purchase uh, commodities, when you buy your, your, your uh, wage goods with your wages, you get all of this garbage with it that you don't really want, but you comes with it and you have to pay for. And uh, the, the waste in the system is just absolutely massive. We call this the interpenetration effect because sales have, have penetrated into production and you have uh, specific, what we call specifically capitalist use values now. Use values that aren't, in any sense, uh, natural material use values in terms of Marx's sense, but use values that are promoted for only one reason, and that is to sell things. Uh, and, um, and marketing is part of this. Uh, we have a, a, a system of financialization now, which is built onto that as a further layer. So we talk about how the real economy, I mean, uh, Marxists don't talk about the real economy being rational, but the mainstream economists talk about the real economy, as they, as they call it, as, as the rational economy. And then we have finance and speculation on top of that. And, uh, and financialization and the financial crisis have shown us how dangerous that is. But that, that's simply another layer of waste and destruction of use values on top of what we've already have. So the, the argument here is, is, um, is that uh, we have the potential, the, that there's actually a growing contradiction between what is, is actual in our society and what is possible. And, but to understand this, you have to look at the metabolism. You have to understand ecological systems as, as a product of our production system. You have to understand how all of this, um, this damage is built into the production system. And we have to understand the waste and the fact that uh, we are producing more and more and threatening the environment while actually giving less and less to the population. Uh, and uh, this, this is complex and I don't have time to develop it. What, how do we, you know, what is the answer to this? Um, 
And uh, I, the, the, I don't have time to, to give you the answer because I'm running out. And, uh, but uh, Tazio says that in, in the last talk I gave, he says, well, you have to talk about agency. So I would say, and uh, the, uh, the, you know, the, the answers are, are, are fairly obvious in some ways. The, uh, we need a society that is geared, as, as Isvan Miseros always tells us, to substantive equality. Uh, no compromise on the issue of equality. Bolivar said equality is the law of laws. And uh, so we need substantive equality and we need uh, ecological sustainability and they have to go together. And how do we know they have to go together? Because, because the, the, uh, what is causing the ecological damage and what is causing the social damage is, is the same thing. It's the rift in the production system, it's the alienation of nature which is one with the alienation of human society. In Marx's perspective, these things are actually, um, it's a whole. Uh, it's, uh, it's an alienated whole, and we have to restore uh, the integrity of it. You can't have substantive equality without ecological su sustainability, and vice versa. That the, another, in, in terms of agency, uh, we have real problems, but there are things that are happening. They're mostly happening in the global south. Uh, I think that we underestimate how much is happening there. The La Via Campesina is, is, you know, the international peasants movement is is has been developing. And incidentally, they've been they've been using the concept of metabolic rift to to justify. There to uh, to explain uh, their own situation, which which is uh, is is exciting, and uh, there's uh, in, look at Bolivia. The the uh, of course there are all sorts of problems about extraction in Bolivia and so on. But but the the people's agreement in Bolivia uh, on climate change is is the best that we have in the world, and it, it's being initiated in the global south. And why is that happening? It's because actually the, the ecological and social contradictions are greater in the global south than they are in the north. And I think that we're likely to see the emergence, or we are already seeing the emergence of an environmental proletariat. And I could talk to you a long time about that. But Basically, material conditions are coming together. We, we're accustomed to think of material conditions as just economic conditions. But increasingly, they're environmental conditions too. And, in, and more and more, the, the uh, distinction between environmental conditions and, and economic conditions uh, are going to dissolve. That uh, we will have an environmental proletariat uh, like they did in, when Engels wrote The Condition of the English Working Class, the main issue in some ways was the environmental conditions. It, uh, it's going to come about that way because if people are motivated by material conditions, uh, it's, they're going to be inextricably linked. And uh, we can see this in terms of the evolution of the ecological crisis. If you look at the Pearl uh, River Delta in China, uh, you get a sense of what could happen. Although we don't have, we are short of time to solve these problems, but we can see at least a logic emerging that at some point will. I'm all oh right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a quote and then, then um, I'll, I'll stop. I'm pretty, uh, so uh, the, um, it's this is. Um, I, I'm quoting, uh, I'm referring to James Hansen, the climatologist, and I say, as, as Hansen has indicated, around 250 million people in China in highly urbanized and industrialized coastal areas will be forced to move inland over time as a result of a sea level rise of 25 meters, which will eventually occur with an increase of atmospheric carbon concentration to 400 ppm a point that is fast upon us. Actually, we had a day or two of four, 400 parts per million. Uh, it w the, the sea level rise won't, won't, will, will come. Uh, it won't all come at once, 
But nonetheless, there's this enormous threat. The transition, if it takes place to the ice-free state, will be chaotic and uncontrolled, he says. New coastlines will not stabilize for a considerable period. Now, this is me. Uh, in China, the low-lying delta of the Pearl River and the Guangdong industrial re region from Shenzhen to Guangzhou overlap. Here, the formation of an environmental proletariat in the above sense is more than possible. Moreover, the context of environmental proletariat is merged in a complex way with the question of an ecological peasantry due to the massive migrant labor system and the relation of this to the land rights in the countryside. Well, I won't go into the rest of this, but the, the point is that there, the, you know, you have this, what, what region is going to be most affected by the sea level rise? Well, it's, um, in China, <laughs> the, China is right, um, is, is very vulnerable in that respect. I mean, Vietnam, China, uh, is South Asia, uh, Bangladesh, but here you have the Pearl River Delta, which is the most industrialized region in the world that um, is threatened by sea level rise. It's just an, an, a sense of what could happen and how it could affect people and how they could think of these things. Anyway, we, we have solutions to all these problems. Uh, Marx said humanity only raises those questions it can solve. We actually have the technologies we need, the renewable technologies. The main thing we have to do is change our social relations. And we, we need conservation. But conservation isn't that tough when you're, you're wasting 99% of everything you produce. Uh, I'll just um, uh, I'll end with, uh, well, um, Epicurus uh, once said, uh, uh, nothing is enough. This might be hard for the translator. Nothing is enough for th for those for whom enough is too little. <laughs> it's it's a paradox. Uh, not you know for those for whom enough is too little. Um, Nothing is ever enough. And, uh, but enough is an important category in our society because, uh, because it's, it sets a level that everyone has to have and, um, and uh, it, it also sets limits to uh, where we're going to go. This is, uh, somebody uh, said to me the other day that Volker's Pispers, uh, uh, I wrote this down, uh, that Volker Pispers said, uh, I would like to ask whether the standard that the GDR represented, represented wouldn't be the one that would work on the world scale in the face of uh, the kinds of uh, world ecological crises that we're now facing. I know that the kind of society that the United States represented uh, uh, would, represents today would doom us uh, and uh, probably all life on the planet. Thank you. Es war sicherlich eines der ersten Male, dass in diesem Saal die ökologische Performance der DDR derart gelobt wurde. Also sagen auch hier, you heard it here first, wollte ich nochmal sagen. Ähm, vielen Dank, John, für diese extrem interessante und lehrreiche Vorlesung. Ähm, ich habe wirklich sehr viel gelernt. Und äh, jetzt hat Thomas Fahrtheuer, glaube ich, eine relativ schwierige Aufgabe. Denn nach dieser Vorlesung, die dann doch vielleicht etwas ideengeschichtlicher war, als ich gedacht hätte, stellt sich natürlich die Frage, des, die alte Frage, was zu tun wäre. John hat gesagt, the main thing to do is to change social relations. Das ist uns ja in den letzten Jahrzehnten nicht unbedingt leicht gefallen und ist, sagen wir mal, strategisch ein wenig unterdeterminiert. Ähm, deswegen... Als ich mit Thomas kommuniziert habe, habe ich zuerst die Frage gestellt, ich hätte jetzt gerne eine, 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 eine politische Diskussion. Was machen wir jetzt angesichts der Tatsache, dass wir wissen, es gibt diesen metabolischen Bruch? Wenn immer sozusagen, wie Kapital reproduziert sich, die erweiterte Reproduktion des Kapitals beinhaltet auch die erweiterte Zerstörung der Natur. Das ist ein abstrakter Satz, der so sehr viel Sinn macht. Gleichzeitig gibt es eine politische Diskussion darüber, wie jetzt kommt, wie im real existierenden Kapitalismus heutzutage die Geschwindigkeit der Umweltzerstörung reduziert werden kann und vielleicht sogar zurückgedreht werden kann. Diese Diskussion muss informiert sein von den theoretischen Konzepten, 
die wir von John lernen und von anderen. Aber sie findet natürlich auf einer anderen Ebene statt. Und ich hoffe sozusagen, mit der Anmoderation habe ich dir die Aufgabe ein ganz klein wenig leichter gemacht, Thomas. Ja, es ist tatsächlich so, dass äh, ich eher auf so ein paar politische Implikationen von John Bellamy's äh, Thesen eingehen wollte. Äh, dazu ein bisschen mich eingelesen, aber nicht auf so die ganze Debatte um den Metabolismus und den metabolischen Bruch. Äh, wobei ich es doch schon sagen muss, das ist, also ich habe das viele Sachen mit sehr großer Gewinn noch mal gelesen von, von John. Und es hat auch tatsächlich, ich glaube, es öffnet einen neuen Blick auf bestimmte Einsichten von Marx und, und animiert einen noch mal, bestimmte Sachen von, von Marx nachzudenken. Das ist sicherlich sehr interessant und, und wichtig. Es trifft sich auch, John hat darauf hingewiesen, auf die diese jetzt im Augenblick auch recht viel diskutierte und in die Diskussion geworfene Debatte um die äh, planetarischen Grenzen, die Planetary Boundaries ne, von Rockström, äh, sind jetzt sozusagen etwas mehr in der Debatte als äh, die alten Geschichten von Club of Rome, die, äh, die man nicht mal so richtig äh, hören will teilweise. Ne? Ähm, Dennoch, so ein paar Punkte würde ich sagen, wenn die Lektüre, vielleicht war meine Lektüre nicht, nicht ähm, umfassend genug, ich habe nicht alles gelesen, äh, was du geschrieben hast, John, das war wirklich nicht zu viel, äh, aber ein paar Sachen, wo ich dachte, die fehlen vielleicht, um eine politische Debatte äh, zu öffnen. Also dieser Blick auf die Welt mit der Marx'schen Brille äh, er ist erhellt, und gleichzeitig denke ich, fällt da auch, fallen da auch Sachen weg, die ich einfach nicht gefunden habe. Mir sind zwei Sachen erstmal aufgefallen. Blickt man nochmal auf die Welt mit ja, auch anderen Blickwinkeln, die auch in der Diskussion sind heute, stellt man erstmal fest, dass nur ein relativ kleiner Teil der Welt, der Fläche dieser Welt, kapitalistisch durchdrungen ist. Ich glaube, das ist ein ganz wichtiger Ausgangspunkt für unsere Diskussion die wir im Augenblick führen, um ökologische Perspektiven, also die ganze Diskussion um die Commons, um Biens Communs oder wie. Das heißt, man hat ja doch gesehen, dass viele Teile der Welt überhaupt nicht kapitalistisch organisiert sind. Ich gebe immer gerne das Beispiel von, ich habe, entschuldige, wenn ich Beispiel aus Brasilien nehme, ich habe von meinen letzten 21 Jahren meines Lebens 18 in Brasilien verbracht. Amazonasgebiet von Brasilien, also die, die Definition, die legale Definition von Amazonas, 50 Prozent von Amazonien sind unter Schutz gestellt, sind indigene Gebiete oder andere Formen von Schutzgebieten. Das ist je nach Rechnung ungefähr die Fläche von drei bis fünfmal Frankreich. Äh, äh, brasilianische Forscher bezeichnen das als, sozusagen, als eine Konfrontation zwischen der, den Territorien des Kapitals, die also tatsächlich einer privatwirtschaftlichen äh, äh, Durchdringung unterzogen sind, gegenüber auf der anderen Seite den äh, Territorien der Völker, die eben nicht in kapitalistischer Weise wirtschaften. Äh, und ich glaube, diese, Ansicht, äh, diese Erkenntnis in der Geschichte jetzt der, der Commons, der Neuentdeckung von Commons, Gemeingütern in der Welt, die hat mir so ein bisschen gefehlt in dieser äh, Analyse und ich glaube, die ist ein ganz wichtiger Ausgangspunkt heutzutage, äh, um Strategiedebatten zu führen und Alternativen zu suchen. Nicht umsonst kommen, glaube ich, deshalb auch manche Alternativen aus dem globalen Süden, wie John sagte, zum Beispiel die Debatte in Bolivien, in Ecuador und das kommt das Bien Vivir. Das um das gute Leben, dass er ganz explizit nicht nur an indigene Konzepte anknüpft, sondern an indigene Produktionsformen, die noch nach wie vor existieren, Gemeinschaften, die existieren. Und äh, wenn wir jetzt eben zu sehen, jetzt mal eine kleine Brücke zu haben, zu dem Ökosystemansatz. Äh, in, der, in dem Mainstream von der Ökosystemforschung hat er sich inzwischen zu einem äh, 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 Service of Ökosystems, Ökosystem Services Ansatz entwickelt, Ökosystem Dienstleistungen. Wir stehen gerade davor in einer Debatte einer Neudefinition von Natur. Nämlich Natur, und das knüpft an an die ganze Debatte, um, um eben Natur als Ökosystem zu verstehen, Natur nun als Dienstleistung zu verstehen. Die Natur äh, bietet Ökosystemdienstleistungen an. Und das Drama dieser Ökosystemdienstleistungen ist, dass sie nicht genug bewertet werden. Äh, das heißt, wir kommen in eine ganze Debatte rein um die Monetarisierung der Natur. 
Ich glaube, das ist eine ganz entscheidende Debatte heute. Äh, hier in, in, in Deutschland läuft eine große Studie von äh, TEEP, äh, The Economy of Ecosystem und Ecosystem Services, äh, äh, durchgeführt in der Leipzig, im Helmholtz-Zentrum Leipzig. Äh, die heißt inzwischen Naturkapital Deutschland. Also die Idee, äh, äh, Natur als äh, parallel zum Kapital zu verstehen und parallel sozusagen, äh, und, und diese Frage, äh, diese, diese Tendenz, dass Teile der Natur kommen sind, äh, als das Problem zu definieren. Sondern da gibt es nämlich keine Eigentumsrechte, keine klar definierten Eigentumsrechte und die Dienstleistungen der Natur, zum Beispiel CO2-Speicherung, werden nicht aus, äh, ausreichend bewertet. Das heißt, da sehe ich im Augenblick eine, eine Riesendebatte, wo es nochmal genau ganz zentral um das Verhältnis Mensch-Natur geht, um gesellschaftliche Neu Bestimmung des Verhältnisses Mensch-Natur und um etwas, was auch äh, viele jetzt eine neue Enclosure of the Commons, eine neue, äh, wie soll ich das auf Deutsch sagen, Einhegung der Commons, äh, 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 als Einhegung der Commons bezeichnen. Die, die große Einhegung der Commons, geschichtlich war die ursprüngliche Akkumulation von, äh, von Marx im, im äh, Kapital gut beschrieben, aber diese Geschichte ist eben nicht abgeschlossen und wir brauchen nicht nur auf die Commons, die von Menschen bewirtschaftet sehen, also 10% der Erdoberfläche sind intensive Landwirtschaft, der Erdoberfläche, der, der Landoberfläche. 30% sind Wälder, fast keine Wälder auf dieser Welt sind in Privatbesitz. Eine riesen, viel mehr als, als, als Landfläche, die, die durch Ackerbau, intensiven Ackerbau be, be, bewirtschaftet wird, sind sogenannte äh, Marginal Lands, wie heute gesagt wird. Oder die Deutschen haben das Begriff Unland gebraucht. Um diese, gerade um dieses Land geht heute ein riesen äh, Krieg los, den wir unter diesen Stichworten äh, Land Grabbing das schon erwähnte Journal of Peasant Studies hat eine, gerade eine Sondermal veröffentlicht im letzten Anfang des Jahres zu Green Grabbing. Also zu denen auch versuchen, über neue Mechanismen dieses, genau dieses Marginal Lands, diese Commons, in einen ökonomischen Zyklus reinzubekommen. Und das ist, glaube ich, eine Frage, die, die ganz zentral ist, wo ich Anknüpfungspunkte sehe in den, in den Darstellungen von John, aber auch in denen, was ich gelesen habe, eigentlich auch eine Lücke, genau auf diese Tendenzen einzugehen und auch zu, zu sehen, dass eben ein Teil der Welt überhaupt noch nicht kapitalistisch durchdrungen ist. Dass der Kapitalismus gerade aber ist, neue, oder unsere Produktionsweise, wie wir sie kennen, neue Grenzen zu erschließen. Das Ganze, die ganzen Ozeane sind Commons, die aus, abgesehen von den Küsten, das ist eine andere Form von Commons, in denen es keine Bewohner gibt, wie auf den, den Land-Commons. Äh, auch da jetzt plötzlich geht ein riesen äh, Run auf die Bodenschätze äh, dieser Ozeane los. Also gerade da haben die neuen Technologien führen dazu, die Grenzen zu erweitern und uns neue Aufgaben zu stellen. Wie gehen wir mit diesen Art von Commons äh, eigentlich um? Wie äh, reagieren wir mit unseren Strategien darauf? Das finde ich nochmal eine zentrale Fragestellung. Und das nochmal zum Schluss, ich glaube, wir können viel mehr in der Diskussion dann machen und ich will jetzt mich auch nicht ausdehnen. Mir ist dann nochmal ein Zitat, ich glaube von Zizek ist es, ne, äh, der gesagt hat, wir können uns heute viel leichter das Ende der Welt als das Ende des Kapitalismus vorstellen. Äh, und das ist natürlich eine, eine, eine problematische Setting für eine Debatte äh, um Alternativen, äh, wenn wir irgendwie unglaublich Schwierigkeiten haben, also über die Grenzen des jetzigen Wirtschaftssystems hinauszudenken und vielleicht nicht in der Form eines Bruchs, weil das nicht zu einer politischen Perspektive im Augenblick führt, sondern zu einer Perspektive des Hirsch sagt es, radikalen Reformismus, der auf eine Transformation zielt. Aber das wäre vielleicht für mich eine Debatte, die wir führen können, äh, von welchem Paradigma des Denken aus können wir gehen, von dieser, sozusagen, dieser, diesem Bruchparadigma, da müssen wir nicht ansetzen heute an einer Transformationsstrategie, die wir gar nicht überschauen können, wo sie genau hingeht, aber wo sich die Kräfte bündeln, die für die das Business as usual weiterzuführen keine Option mehr ist. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, John. Thank you for your amazing input, and thank you, Thomas, for rising to the. Thank you, Thomas, for rising to the challenge of connecting it back to the realm of politics and policy. And um, I very much want to thank the translators because I uh, can imagine this was a difficult ride. And thank you very much for the great work. And thank you for braving the rain and uh, making it for this Luxembourg lecture. And we hope to see you again. Mm -hmm.